let's just start over again. Welcome. We are live. And this was the way it goes. Live sometimes things a little bit like a bee. We're here to talk tonight, you guys, about where you live affects how you renovate. North versus south and a couple other bonus points. We're not going to worry about that right now. But what I want to talk about first is this. Um, we're going to be doing a couple of giveaways today, right? We're going to do one right after my preamble and then one near the end of the show. And uh, I want to talk to you quick, real, let me just plug Saturday's video that's coming out. We've got uh, my favorite. It's my easiest fence I ever built. I've done a couple of fence videos in the past. But this is by far the easiest and, might I say, the sexiest fence I've ever built. All right, you're going to want to watch that video, so make sure you're there. Check that out. 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. It goes live on YouTube. And next Tuesday, we're live again right here. And it's going to be an interesting subject matter. I'm going to be talking about why I'm optimistic about the housing market. I know, in a world of doom and gloom, Jeff has a different opinion, and I want to share it with you. And I'm going to back it up with some numbers and some cold, hard truth. And we're going to have a little bit of a rant, and it'll be good. The world needs to, um, how should we say, not so be so easily distracted. Now, let's get into today's information, and then we can jump into our, our, our giveaway, and then we'll answer some live Q&A right here to our members, the rule of the live show is this. If you are a member, you're in the chat. If you're not in the live show, you're not in the chat. And what I'm noticing right now, there we go. Now I've got my live chat in front of me, that helps. Um, if you're not a member, guys, and you, and you wanna have a question get answered, when we get to the Q&A section, just do a super chat. Nice and simple. Or you can join the membership in the meantime, okay? You might as well, all right? Uh, membership is awesome. I think everybody that's doing a DIY project at their house should be a member because you get access to me. I know. I really actually give a rip. I want to see you guys be successful in your renovations. And so we're answering questions. You can send me pictures. We're doing everything we can to help, including weekly live shows now because we just really need to feel like we need to be here on a more frequent basis answer those questions so that when you run into problems, you can run into a problem on one weekend, join the live show, and get your solution for the next weekend, right? That's just the perfect solution. Okay, so let's jump into this. Where you live, how it affects how you renovate. <sighs> you know, for years, we've been watching renovation shows on TV, and we've been looking at uh, like HGTV, let's just say, okay, or now the Magnolia Channel for Chip and Joanna. And Everybody that does this show, they live in a different climate. Uh, this old house largely does things in Boston, which is in the north. And so as a DIYer, if you're watching these shows, you go, oh, that's how that's done. Or that's how you do that. And if you don't live in the same climate, you could be doing something absolutely horrific and causing yourself a lot of pain and a lot of mold development. So let's talk about how we avoid all that. Um, I would love to stay right current in the chat at this point, Michelle. By the way, guys, my wife is joining me tonight. She's helping me on the computer. And here we are. First thing we're going to use is a great big word called permeability. Yeah, I know, permeability. Wow, that's sexy. And then here's the deal. And, and, and save all your questions until we're done talking about this, because I'm not going to go back and look at them later. We're going to answer them live in the chat when we go to questions, okay? But we're talking about permeability. There are only two things on this planet that are impermeable, which means water can't pass through them. And they're both man-made. And that is glass and steel. Everything else on the planet has a perme permeability factor. Okay? So the easiest way to think about this is if you pour water on paper, it doesn't fall through the paper. It absorbs into the paper and then it drips out of the paper. Gravity. That's permeability. Okay? So what we've got in our home construction technology, technology is this. Most of the materials we use here in North America are very permeable. We've got wood. We have um, uh, like OSB, Oriented Strand Burn, plywood, right? Masonry. All these materials, water travels through. Drywall, water travels through. Okay? And so... What we have to do is take a look at our construction technology and the permeability scale and realize that where you live makes a difference. If you live in a southern climate and you don't get rain and you get less than 20 inches a year, 
permeability is less of an issue for you for how does your house dry out from the weather as much as how does your house dry out from you? Because you also breathe and that creates water vapor and that needs to leave the house. Boiling water, showering, all this stuff, that moisture needs to leave. Now, if your house is permeable, which means water can pass through it, then generally speaking, you're in decent shape, right? Building code says, hey, maybe you should open a window when you shower. Um, and if you're in the north, hey, that's a stupid idea. And we adopted that in building code for years up until the late 70s. We built houses with no fan in the bathroom when it's minus 36 outside. Ha, 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 ha. You bet. Yep, millions of houses got moldy bathrooms because nobody's dumb enough to open their window when they're having a shower when it's middle of January. Okay, so the building code be damned. we got to use our brains. You as renovators in your own home have to pay attention to who you're following and where they are. One of the reasons why right now I'm in Florida. That's right, I'm down here on a work visa, I guess they call it. Not a business visa, I'm on a work visa. And so I've been renovating in Ottawa, Canada for years on this channel. And it's funny because I run into people all the time. They're like, oh, I thought you were from some Seattle or Vancouver or Florida or Texas or Boston. No one has a clue. I don't brag about it. I'm from Ottawa, Canada. I'm, I'm born and bred Canadian. I get it. I'm proud of it to a certain extent. Not proud of where they're going right now, but I'm proud to be Canadian. <sighs> Our building science technology up there is really northern climate. And it's not Chicago. It's not New York building. It's not Buffalo. It's freaking cold northern Canada. All right. That's the building science we have to follow. So when you watch me and I'm covering my walls after I insulate with plastic and six mil plastic at that. The first thing you got to say to yourself is, where do I live? Is that building code in my city? Okay. Because if it isn't, and this is the dramatic, this is what we're going to talk about, the dramatic one right here. If you are in the South and you put six mil poly, good luck finding it, by the way. They don't carry it at the store because no one uses it because it's not in your building code. But if you cover your walls with six mil poly because you bought it on Amazon or some other crazy source, here's what you're going to find. All the humidity from outside is coming into your wall and it's getting trapped by a Im almost impermeable layer. A little bit of permeability, but it's close to non-permeable. And all that moisture will sit there and it'll provide a food source for the mold that lives in the wood. And then that mold will override everything else. And sooner or later, you'll see it on your wall. By the time you see it on your drywall or your stucco, it's too late. Your wall's infested and your house is unlivable and you're going to be destroying your home. So for the love of God, when you're watching shows, pay attention to who you're watching, where they live, and always, always, always consult local building codes before you move forward. Okay. Because there are a lot of different factors that affect how you do things. Like for instance, we talked about permeability real quick. Let's talk about frost, right? If you're building a shed or you're doing a deck or you're doing something outside or you're doing an addition, frost counts. What's your frost zone? How deep do you have to put your footing on your house? If you're in Texas, a foot. If you're in Florida, pff, just pour your concrete right on your dirt, right? But up in Canada, we got to go down almost five feet now. That's a big deal. That's excavation. And we're getting more and more dramatic about what we want for footings to the point where it doesn't even make sense to have dirt in a backyard if you want to build a deck. You almost got to remove all the earth to five feet down, put in your footings, and then bring all your earth back. Hi, yi yi. That's why I show you how to do floating decks because it makes practical sense. You just want a place to sit, not soaking wet in the dirt and the bugs. So that's what that's for. But you can't do floating decks in Florida because of the windy season. They'll pick that deck up and slam it through somebody's living room. Right? And then all of a sudden, that little piece of half-inch plywood over the hurricane window ain't going to do a damn bit of good. So we got to follow building code. we got to pay attention to who you're watching, where they're living. Is that relative to me? Here on this channel, I'm really hoping over the next three, five, ten years that we're going to be able to travel around North America and get into a bunch of different building zones. So we've got proper instructions for different kinds of building climates so that there's a body of work here that'll help a lot of people for a lot of years. That's kind of the goal. All right. Now, it also lets the effects where you live affects your flooring. <laughs> what? That just sounds stupid, doesn't it? No, hang on. No, hold on. Because 
let's get real for a second. Your flooring, if you're living in a conditioned space, which means you have heat and air conditioning when it's needed, and you can maintain some kind of steady climate, your flooring has rules about how it gets installed depending on where you are geographically because the rules are designed to protect your flooring from failing on you in extreme climate scenarios where you lose power and you lose the ability to moderate your temperature. It ain't about it worked on Tuesday. It's all about this. If the power fails, like in Texas a couple of years back, and it goes cold, is the way that they put my flooring in going to fail? And a majority of failing in flooring installations in the way of hardwood and tile especially, tile specifically is susceptible to bad temperature problems and failure, all right? So in the northern climate, we've got all kinds of rules about how thick a floor needs to be to protect against deflection, which is good. But we also have rules about the kind of coverage that the, the, the thin set has to have with the tile, okay? Coverage is important because... Things delaminate when it gets really cold. You've got to have spacing and gaps and expansion and contraction. There's a lot of building science that goes into doing a floor effectively because any moron can install a floor that doesn't fail when it's exactly 72 degrees in the house. But when it's minus 35, you'll find out if your moron who put in your floor knew what he was doing. I'm telling you right now. So we want to do that. We also have to pay attention to building code. Where you live affected by building code, because here's the deal. We have a Canadian building code. We got a USA building code. We got a national, we got an international building code. We got international energy code. We got all these codes that people are adopting at different levels and different rates. What about where you live? Have you ever even checked? Do you know that you can go to a state and, and, and there's different provinces have different codes as well in Canada, but in the state specifically, it's not just the state, it's the county. Every county can choose to adopt a code or not because there are states that have cities that are incredibly wealthy and they have cities that are incredibly not wealthy. And so they tend to make an adjustment for we're going to give more freedom to people to do what they want in areas where there's lower population and the housing values are, are depreciated because we don't want to how should we say lord it over them that you have to reach this code on a house that's worth $60,000. You want to change your kitchen? Here, blah, ram a code down your throat that costs 100000 bucks. That's just insane, right? So you've got to pay attention. You might have building codes in your state that apply, but not in your county. So always check your county building office. I'm telling you right now, I'm sorry. I feel like I've done you all an injustice. Because now when you call your county office, you're going to get this the line. You're waiting in order, but it's extremely busy, unusually so. So we'll get to you in about a week if you can hang on, right? I'm sorry, but you got to call your local building office, guys, because there's a lot of rules out there that change. If you take a drive, every five minutes you're going to America, the code changes every five or ten minutes. There's no one standard out there, which is why you can't you can't go and turn on a TV and say, well, he's the person I like or she. I like the way that person's renovating because they have a code they're adhering to and they have or they inflate their rules and they want to all high and mighty on this channel. We're practical. OK. And if you live in a place where there's lots of freedom and you don't have as many building codes and you can renovate something cheap, damn it, I'm going to show you how to do it. But if you got to follow codes, you're going to get in trouble and when you're going to have compliance issues and you're going to have trouble selling your house. I don't want you doing that either. OK. Right. So if you live in California, you're in L.A. and you're trying to DIY something and you're not getting a building permit. Dear Lord, you're going to run into some trouble. Don't do it. Get your damn permit and then watch this channel. Learn how to do it right. That's all. OK. Energy code. This is a big issue, too. Up north, we have R20 in our walls now which means you have to build a wall out of a two by six. And we also have the code set up so that your basement has to have the same insulation as upstairs because part of your basement is exposed to the same temperature as upstairs. Our, our top two or three feet are actually exposed to the air. So you have a basement that's smaller and then you build a two by six wall inside of that and it makes it smaller and people get upset. So a lot of people have gone, oh, I'm gonna make a two by four wall and not make the wall as thick and I'm not getting a permit because I don't wanna tell anybody. 
but you create an imbalance in your heating system. Okay, so now you don't possibly have enough heat in your basement. You can't enjoy it anyway. So just follow the darn code. It doesn't even cost that much more money to be compliant. All right, and live comfortable. When it comes to outside versus inside, where you live matters. Okay, like you've got to pay attention. Outdoor living spaces, you really got to pay attention to their building code because it's there to help you in these cases. They don't last. If you are if you try to go and pour yourself, you can't just dig a hole and spray on concrete like you do in Florida and make a pool. Not if you're in Canada. Dear Lord, that ain't going to work. No, 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 no. We got to put in pools. We got to put in gravel. We got to put in drainage. We got to put in clean backfill. We got to, like, it's incredible what you have to go through to have a pool that's refreshing for the six to eight weeks a year that you actually need it. Don't even ask me why we have them. Be honest with you. But, you know, hey, some people do. Now, one more thing I want to add to where you live matters when it comes to your, your, your house. There are a lot of people that live in condos or HOAs. Okay. And they all have rules. They have rules as to, I had a, I had someone in the comments the other day, all right, on um, the members chat. And they're like, well, I've got this issue with my front door. And I'm like, wait a minute. If you're in a condo, that's probably not a your issue. Okay. Make sure if you live in a condo or an HOA and, and, and you're paying for services, you read the guidelines. If you're in a condominium building, for instance, there's a certain quality of underlayment that has to go under your flooring for sound transmission control so you don't drive your neighbors crazy, which is one of the most common complaints I get on all my soundproofing videos. My neighbors are noisy and I can hear every step they take. Well, they probably broke the rules and didn't put the right sound underlayment in. And all you got to do is report them to the condo and say, hey, can you go confirm that they actually put in the right stuff? And it's not that tricky, right? Show me the invoice for your sound underlayment. And if the condo board says, hey, you don't have an invoice for sound underlayment, well, let's pull off a baseboard and pull back a piece and check. And if you don't have it, guess who's in trouble? The guy that installed the flooring. There are rules for a reason. We try our best in society not to drive each other too crazy. Okay? It's not easy. I know. Everybody's nuts. We're all nuts. Hell, I'm crazy. I'm just the right kind of crazy. <laughs> if we follow the rules and we try to do our best with the compliance, we minimize how much we drive everybody nuts and we'll all get along a little bit better. But the point is, your house you're living in isn't going to be yours forever. Most people move. So the idea that we had back in the 1700s of this is the family farm, the homestead, it's gone. This ain't Yellowstone, honey. This ain't going to be something we pass down to every generation. We're going to sell it. So we got to make sure that we keep it safe for the next inhabitants of that house. we got to make sure that when we renovate, we make sure that we're not driving our neighbors crazy if we have them be under us, above us, and left and right of us. Okay? Let's all do our part to be compliant to a certain degree. Because compliance, really, it's not, it's not tyranny. It's just compliance. Okay? It's okay to follow the rules. Coming from a Canadian, trust me, there's a lot of rules that I don't like to follow. Safety, for instance, I think it's crazy. But as long as I'm working on my own house, you're damn right I'm not following the OSHA rules because I think it's nuts and it slows me down. But as soon as I'm on a job site, honey, on goes the safety glasses, the hard hat, and the safety boots. Because you know what? You got to be compliant or you're going to face a fine. And that's all I got to say about that. Now, listen, let's just jump right into this because we are going to do a giveaway right about now. And all you got to do is hashtag in the comment section, hashtag DIY crew. That's who you are. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do because we care about our crew. You're my crew. All right. I don't have a crew working for me. I do everything myself pretty much right now. Hopefully that'll change in the near future. But right now, you're my crew, so you hashtag DIY crew, and you are going to be in the draw. We're giving away a $100 gift certificate. And you know what? That doesn't sound like much, but if I was just walking down the street and I bumped in, you said, hey, how'd you like a brand new drill? And I handed it to you. Well, hallelujah. That's a good day, isn't it? And that's what we're doing, because you can buy a brand new tool without a battery for 100 bucks. This is about anything. So if you're looking for a tool, hashtag DIY crew. Mitch, what I want you to do here, baby. Let's stay live in the chat all the time. 
stay scrolled all the way to the bottom so I can follow what's going on, okay? Yeah, here we go. And then, um, okay, so what you're also saying about that, and don't forget, if you missed it, we did a little poll here, the DIY crew. Do you live in the north or the south? Um, there's only 87 votes in that poll, so go check the comments for that and make sure you're in there. All right, now let's get live in the chat and stay there. It makes my life simple because I am not a multitasker. I kind of like to focus. This is how I get this done. Let's see who's in the house. We got Sandy, we got Mary, Tim, AJ, Michael, Jason, Melanie Rourke. Melanie Rourke, my God. Melanie, I haven't seen or heard from you in a little while. Good to see you back here. Um, just stay live in the chat for me, baby. And Eric is at the control center back in Ottawa. Hey, Yinzer House from Pittsburgh, if I remember correctly. Look at that. I don't think my brain has been this good in a long time. Oh, Donald's in the house, the gooseneck guy. Everybody's got a handle. Tom finally became a member this week. Well, it's about time, Tom. Welcome to the membership. Welcome to the crew. All right, guys. We're going to give you about uh, 30 seconds, and then Eric's going to push a button, and he's going to announce a winner because that's how we do it. All right? And then what, remember what technology is going on behind this? I have no idea. We're able to contact you and make sure that you get your price, okay, which is a great deal. Woo! Oh, uh, uh. all right. Well, we're done with that. Next. Okay. Here we go. I think uh, Eric's got this under control. He's going to be able to hand this out. Do we have a winner yet? Mitch, can you see the other screen? I want to see the live, live screen here. No? He hasn't picked it yet? <laughs> Spinning now. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Where's the region poll? Well, it's in the comment section, Michael. It's probably a hundred comments back now. We got a winner. Melanie Rourke ends up winning. That's crazy. Oh, Michelle, you've got me going there. Mark, Mark Simon is the winner. All right. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Congrats, Mark. Hopefully you can enjoy your new tool or a bag of dog food or something. That's actually where I get my dog food is on Amazon, believe it or not. It's just so, I know you're so close, Mal. That's okay. You know, we're going to do another giveaway at the end of the show. Why the hell not? Just in case. All right. So, Mal, if you got another 40 minutes left in you, you can hang around to the end and give it another shot. Here we go. Let's get on with some questions. We got some Q&A. And while I'm here, I'm going to, no, stay live right here. Anybody who asks a question, uh, I missed you because I wasn't answering them yet. So you have to ask it again. And we'll get you in there. But first, I want to remind you, Tuesday, next week, live show, why I'm optimistic about the housing market. We're going to expand our studio here a little bit. We're going to be bringing out the old easel. We got some graphs and some numbers and some science here for you. Why I think you don't have to be petrified to buy a new house. I know, it's crazy. It's actually a really good time to buy. And we're going to explain all that. Uh, don't forget Saturday, I've got a new video coming out. It's a privacy screen video, which is basically fence on your deck. It's so easy to do. Like there's no holes to dig or nothing. You can knock off the easiest, sexiest fence you've ever seen in your life. Only takes a few minutes. It's the best way to spend a weekend. That video's coming up Saturday. Don't miss it. And of course, if you're watching and you're not a member, that's okay. And if you got a burning question that is life and death to you, then hit us up in the super chat, which is basically a way that your comment gets highlighted so I can see it and I can make sure that I answer your question. We can help you out too. That'd be cool. <laughs> Loving the chat. All right. Um, but up, but up, but up, but up. By the way, I almost forgot. Next week's live show. We are. I'm going to tease you with this right now. Um, we're going to be asking a trivia question in order to win a prize. So we're not just going to tell you what to hashtag. You're going to have to have the answer yourself. It's going to require a little bit of work. So Saturday's video. You're going to have to watch it. And then we're going to ask a trivia question on Saturday's video. And only people who watch Saturday's video are going to know the answer to the question. And all kinds of people are going to put in the wrong hashtag and answer it wrong. And so only the people that get it right are going to be in the draw this time. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. But I, uh, I like to reward those. If you put in the time, you deserve the dime. All right. Let's just move on. No more notes. 
No more nothing. No more phone. Cheers to all of you. Uh, so before I jump into these questions, I wanted to say I am down here in Florida. I'm at my double wide. I'm renovating like a madman. I'm having so much fun. I ran into so many problems. It isn't even funny. There's going to be such great videos coming out of this. But we overcome them all. You know why? Because it's just building. You just got to do the time, put in the work, keep a smile on your face. You get through the project and everything's going to be fine. I was actually doing some concrete work today and working on some mud work today. And that's great. Let's jump into the questions. Wow. Right away. Is it advisable to remove the inside trim for the mudroom door and windows to convert them to trimless look? If so, is there anything more I need to take into account before finishing with a corner bead? Yeah, it's not quite that simple. Um, the modern look without the trim work, there's actually, it's, it's, a, it's a vinyl trim that you need to get that you can install, okay? And it's part of your drywall package. So even your drywall in that room is installed incorrectly to use that trim, okay? So you really got to go right back to the framing in your installation in order to achieve that kind of modern look, all right? So it's not quite as simple as you might be thinking right out of the gate. Um, there are a couple of hacks that you can use to try to get around some of that work, but the, the end result isn't modern sexy. It's modern sloppy. So be careful. Um, last time I checked, casings and baseboards were still in style. There's no need to upgrade your home to that level of sex appeal unless you live in the L.A. hills. All right. All right. Mike, should I wait for my pressure treated deck boards to dry and the green stains to fade before sealing or am I fine to seal it immediately? Well, first of all, I know you've probably been watching the channel, Mike, and you've seen that I seal with a lot of different products on this channel over the years. <sighs> I want you to take a look at my latest fence video about restoring a fence and consider buying a sealer slash stain that has UV protection in it. It's always a two part product. It always needs to be mixed. It'll give you a lot more protection. Okay. And yes, you probably want to wait till your pressure treated gets bleached out from the sun a little bit so that you're not adding colorant to your green. All right. Um, there's nothing wrong with pressure treated bleaching out. It doesn't cause it any damage, okay? So giving it a few months for that to happen is never an issue. But make sure that when you're going to go seal it, that you're sealing it before you get into any kind of like the three and four seasons, like fall, winter, spring. Anytime through the summer you want to let something dry out, you're fine. Into the fall, you start running into that risk of, am I getting there on time? Is the weather going to go so bad before I get my chance to do it, right? So manage that. But yeah, uh, you're good. David. Your basement is roughed in. Nice. The walls are insulated, but the bats are sagging down. How do I fix that? Okay. Well, David, uh, bats are designed to be on compression. So if it's exactly 16 inches on center, is it exactly 16 inches on center? <laughs> or let's put it this way. If you put it in and your wood has got a bit of a bow to it, right? And that latch the insulation sag. And you're like, I don't want to close it while it's sagging. Then you can do this. Ready? Here's a, here's a secret. Go to the hardware store. Grab yourself a roll of all round. Now, okay, I'm going to draw it out. Um, all round for everybody who isn't aware is a metal strapping product that we use in plumbing all the time. Okay, looks something like this, all right? And it comes in a roll, stainless steel, you can get it in copper, you can get it in galvanized, and you can do this. You can put it on your wall, on the face of your stud, throw a screw in it, measure over, straighten your stud to exactly 16 inches on center. You wanna see this again? It looks like this, all round metal strapping, go to the plumbing department. And you can, you can get rid of the bows in your studs by adding strapping on the face before you drywall. The secret here is don't do it at the four foot mark from the ceiling, okay? Go at about 50 inches from, from, sorry, 50 inches from the ceiling 
All right, okay, or, or 40 inches from the ceiling. So you're not putting the strapping right where the joint is, okay, when you drywall. But what it'll do is it'll help take all these bowed pieces of wood and straighten them out in the middle of the wall so your insulation stays compressed properly. It's a quick fix. It's a cheat. I've never done it on a video before, but if you start at one end of the room and run a 50-foot 50 50 strap all over the other side, you can measure off the measuring tape, 16, 16, 16, bam, 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 and make it perfect every time. Then when you drywall over the strapping, who cares? Listen, it's not going to affect anything because we've already got metal cover plates that we hammer on to protect plumbing and electrical protrusions. Those kind of minor surface bumps disappear when you drywall. So when you just consider, if I'm going to put drywall at 48 inches and I put a screw, and then I go 16 inches above that, well, if you put that all round, eight inches above where you're right in the middle, you're not going to hit it a second time. It's not going to matter, but it'll straighten everything out and it'll hold all your insulation in place. Now, if they're not 16 inches on center, eh, the best thing you can do then is throw a couple of screws in the side of the stick to hold the insulation up because it may not really be worth it to tear it all apart and start over again. But for boat insulation, that is a great trick. And that is for you, my friend. Now, Michael's got a question. Ah, what kind of power washer should I use for moving the paint from a block wall? That's a really good question. You're going to need a little bit more power than an electric one. I recently bought a Craftsman pressure washer for sale at Lowe's. And it was 300 bucks. The electric ones were two. This is gas powered. Now, the problem with the gas powered washer is if your block wall is in a basement, for instance, you got fume issues, right? But you can run it outside and bring your hoses inside. And that works too, if you need it to. Um, and that one that I bought comes with four different nozzles. So you get different kinds of pressure, okay? Generally speaking, paint on a block wall, it, it's going to give up the ghost. And because this is it, here's your block, here's your paint. It doesn't soak in. It just sits on the surface. So you throw any pressure at that at all, and it's going to pop right off. It's just about efficiency. So if you got an eight-inch wide spray, and it's working, great. If it doesn't work, you move a little closer until it's a four-inch spray, and then it starts working. Well, then that just tells you how long it's going to take to get the job done. But uh, if you get an electric one, you don't have those kind of options in most cases. And sometimes you're throwing good money after bad. So try to go gas. If you're concerned about the fumes because it's a basement project and that doesn't work out for you, um, you can put in negative air. You can buy a respirator. You can do all kinds of stuff like that. And it will work. All right. William, six mil poly behind the backer board in the shower always? Or is this a regional thing, Cincinnati, Ohio? Great question. It's even topical. Cheers, William. Six mil poly behind the backer board in the shower is part of the insulation code for northern climates. A lot of insulation codes are paper-faced insulation, and that paper is actually the permeability layer. It's the semi-permeable paper. It's been treated. So the, the rate on the scale is from zero to hero, and every product is somewhere up and down that scale. Okay, so when you look at it, plastic is close to glass. And the paper is somewhere in the middle. And that's for most of the Central America, Central United States. Here's how you can tell. If you go to the Home Depot where you live and they sell paper-faced insulation, you're in a part of the area where the code requires it and you don't need the plastic because there's nowhere in the code that says you need paper-faced plus plastic. And that's how we eliminate the confusion, okay? And if you're still not sure, Call the local building office. Send them an email. I have yet to contact a local building office anywhere in North America that didn't respond to my email within 48 hours. Just saying. Free advice from the people that are going to tell you yes or no anyway. Might as well take it. All right. Nicholas, what is the best way to build a surface drain for gutters and yard drainage? Treat cheap drains versus PVC. Do I put rocks under the drain? Okay, here's the go. Yeah, it's a whole lot of question. I don't want to read it all. Here you go. The cheapest drain is a, um, it's, it's a perforated plastic pipe. It's got holes and it's got a sock on it. That's a cheap drain. What you do is you dig a bit of a hole and then you, you put this drain in there on, on a really good landscape cloth that's almost per, impermeable, okay? And then you backfill with rock. And that's the cheapest drain. The expensive ones 
they're like a few bucks a foot to buy something rectangular that has a little steel grate on it. And those are generally only used in, in finished patio applications anyway. But the French drain, we call it, designed by Dr. French, and it's not a, not a geographical or ethnic issue, it is a sock that has holes that allows the water to collect rapidly, covered in clean stone, not stone dust, that allows the water to just pass through, boom, and it sends it in a gravity slope situation. So all you got to do is get that quarter in, quarter degree slope on there and you're good. All right. Here we go. Jason Pereira, two floor house. So yeah, thanks for being a member for like ever in a day. We actually have to update our member pictures. I'm thinking we've got to come up with a two year member icon. Because we've got people that have been part of this membership for that long and longer. And it, it would be nice to be able to say, hey, maybe we, uh, we, we do that kind of like the video game thing where we make your house gold instead of blue. Man, yeah, suggestions, anyone? Let me know what you think. Maybe maybe gold, like a gold gun in, in, in some of your video games you guys play. I know my son would love that. Um, you join two pieces of crown on a long wall. And even though you use spackle, it still shows. Any techniques to cover it? Yep. Put in a pot light. <laughs> My kingdom for a crown molding joint that never shows up. First of all, here's what you're dealing with. Your crown. Um, if it's manufactured out of polyurethane, they're both the same size. That helps. Most crown is either MDF or wood. And they don't mill them the same size. Because wood is milled and then it's... What was the humidity on both pieces when it was milled? If it was a couple of degrees off, they're different sizes when they both dry out in your house. And so you're screwed right from the beginning. The best way to deal with crown molding is to put in some pot lights so that people aren't staring at your ceiling directly where the joint is. You will not find perfect crown molding anywhere on the planet. Give yourself a break, okay? Do your best. Understand expansion and contraction happens even in houses with, with heating and cooling systems, all right? And don't be too picky on yourself, all right? This is about getting close, but not perfect. And that becomes the new perfect. So being close is perfect every time. That's all I'm saying. Cut yourself some slack. All right. Adam, you got a three-inch slab of live-inch birch for a counter island. That is a thick piece of wood, dude. What should I adhere to the bark? Oh, yeah. So... You can't do anything to keep the bark attached to the wood better. But what you can do is you can turn that bark into a solid piece of bark so it doesn't chip. So use a clear polyurethane finish. Okay. And what and that's what we did in the bathroom video. Uh, the farmhouse bathroom live edge countertop. We just used three or four coats of polyurethane. And so that if you accidentally bump it with an elbow or something, you're now, you can't chip off a piece because it's all one piece. You make it bulletproof that way. Yeah. If you hit it hard enough, the entire thing will pop off. And, you know, go make another one. But, yeah, that's how it's done. All right. Um, here we go. Oh, neat name. Randier. Randier. 1915 house in Florida. <laughs> Can I give you my advice? Um, first thing you do is go in the attic and attach some hurricane straps because they didn't use them back then. Next, I have lattice around the crawl space. Cool. Do you think it would make sense to replace it with pressure treated plywood with blue board insulation inside crawl space too low to insulate the floor? Okay, first of all, if you're watching my videos on crawl spaces, those were filmed in a northern climate with minus 35 in the wintertime. We had to seal them off, insulate them, vapor barrier them, and add heat to that space in order to condition that space so that our floors weren't freezing. In Florida, you don't have that problem. You have a reverse issue. You've got high humidity. So you want airflow is the solution in your climate. I love the topical questions, guys. Keep them coming. Airflow is king. Okay, so, well, you know, I'm going to do the best I can do, baby. John wants to know what's a good way to finish drywall on a wall where you don't plan on putting drywall on the ceiling in a mechanical room, for instance. Okay. So you want to put drywall up and leave the ceiling exposed, but you want a nice clean edge. Well, yeah, 
there really isn't a whole lot you can do there. If you want a nice clean edge, um, once you've put it all up, throw a piece of cord around on it. Because if you're installing it horizontally, you're going to have that, that, that beveled edge. And you want to clean that up, make it flat so you don't see the beveled edge. The only other thing you can do is you can install it vertical. And you can buy J-trim. It's a piece of uh, um, steel that wraps the edge of the drywall. Okay, so that you can actually finish that and have one clean line. And that'll give you a look you're looking for, but you got to be able to install your drywall vertical, which means you got to be framed so that you can get it done. Nice. And Mike bought the C2 guard. Good for you, Mike. That stuff is phenomenal. All right. I can't say it enough. It's the best damn product I've ever used in my life to solve a problem I've ever had. Because every other time I've ever stained anything in my life, I was disappointed with the result. This stuff, nada. It's springtime on that deck that's in that series now. It's already gone through the whole winter. They're already out there enjoying it. And they're like, yeah, maybe we could add a little more color this year, but eh, we'll see. And they were shoveling the damn deck through the winter to try to enjoy their fire pit. Like that's how bulletproof that stuff is. It's amazing. Oh, Mary. Yeah, Mary, it's you. You're the one. You're the reason I'm doing a double wide trailer. <laughs> yep. You know it. You know it, girl. Thanks a lot, Mary. <laughs> I am up to my neck in issues and I'm loving it because... Double wide trouble. <laughs> Loving it. Dan, welcome to the membership, buddy. Uh, Tom's got a question. You got an old destroyed wood floor. Old rug pad stuck to it. Yeah, rotted, got it. Missing pieces. Mm -hmm. Better off removing it or can I steal it and lay new flooring over the top? I want to just hesitate, Tom, to say to remove your flooring. Oh, we got a couple of super chats here we got to get to, guys. We'll get there in a second. Vitaly, I'll be right there, bud. One second. If you have old wood flooring, the word old scares me because sometimes old means old, like 1905 old. And tongue and groove hardwood in 1905 was actually the subfloor that all the walls were built on without any consideration as to where the structural support in the house was because that wood was so strong, they didn't need to think about it. So you could actually be pulling wood out that's holding your house up old. So I don't want to suggest that that's a good idea. What I will say is this, if you don't take your flooring back to a clean, smooth, flat surface, you won't have a good installation. So you maybe not remove it, maybe get yourself a floor sander, okay? But uh, you know, um, that's about as best I can do. Now I gotta get to Vitaly here because he's been super chatting the living daylights out of me here and I feel like I owe him the rest of the show. All right. Dude, that's not necessary, but thank you. We love you too. Sloped backyard, one and a half inch elevation gain over eight foot. Got it. Toronto clay. Good. How to build a pad for 82 by 82 hot tub. Up to lots of water, wood or concrete. That's a great question. Um, so let's deal with that question first. Okay. Neither. <laughs> gotcha. Stone dust. Build a pad out of stone dust. Make sure that it is permeable. If you build a pad with concrete or on wood, you're going to have structural issues. You're going to have shifting. You're going to have frost issues. You're going to have heaving. You're going to have inconsistencies. But if you put it on something that is permeable, water can drain through it. All right. And if you ever get frost and heaving on it, it can readjust and shift its weight as things settle. Okay. So stone dust is the answer for you, my man. It perfect every time. Now you can go concrete around it. You can, you can frame a deck around it afterwards, do a floating deck, but put your hot tub on stone dust. Mm -hmm. That's my best advice ever. Second question you got here. Great video about blown in insulation. Do I need to add some blocking for ventilation through the soffits? If yes, how many? Hearing different things, but I trust only Jeff, house built 1990. If your house is built in 1990, you have fresh air soffits. Every second soffit, that fresh air needs to enter into the attic. Okay, so you got to protect it. You can put in a baffle system that'll provide a, a, a security. It's like an egg crate thing, right? You just staple it on the roof. And that'll provide the, the safety for fresh air to make it into the attic so that you can keep the heat down in the summertime. And then you can stuff all that insulation right in around the bottom and, and fill it all up. No worries. Okay. So that works for that one. And then here's the third one. You passed your electrical heating, framing, drain, and water supply rough and inspections for your basement. Golf clap. I don't have sound effects. 
Jeff once said that inspectors are friends to the DIYers, not enemies. Thank you, sir, for all this info. You're damn right they are. You know why? Because at the end of the day, they're humans and they want their neighbors to be successful too. They just want them to comply because they want you to sell a house to the next guy and not screw them over. That's all. It's really not that tricky, is it? All right, Vitaly, thank you so much. Yeah, I got a big fan out there. Toronto. Now, uh, and cheers, buddy. All right, and congratulations. That's a hell of a job. Now you got to deal with the drywall. Arr. Okay, Michael, you live in Maine. You're five miles from the Canadian border. And you got a Gentech dealer about a half an hour drive away. Would it be worth going there for their windows and doors? No. Deal with their American counterparts. Okay. Um, oh, I got to get this right now. It's been too long since I focused my brain on that energy. Um, uh, wow. Associated materials. Yes. Associated Materials is the parent corporation for Gentech and their siding and window and door operation in the United States. Find a local dealer. You don't have to go across the border, okay? Because you're probably going to have to pay tariff and stuff on stuff like that if you bring that material across. So don't go, don't go through all that hassle. It's not worth the drive. You can find a local dealer that sets up exactly the same way. You can go in. You can set up an account. You can come all side. All side? All side is the name of the company in the United States. I gave you the parent company, but you can go to Allside. Just go Allside, Maine. There'll be a couple, all right? They'll probably have one in Bangor, maybe another one somewhere else. But the point is, deal with Allside in your own state, and they will make the windows that are designed for your weather as well. You don't have to overbuy, although Maine's probably about the same kind of crazy wind and cold as it is. But uh, I would go that way. Cheers, Michael. All right, Cirrus. You took cheap wallboard off an enclosed porch to insulate and finish. Okay. It's odd it was never sheathed. Okay. Just the siding and it's backing. Okay. Don't need spacers for air gap, then rigid foam before bats. Iowa. This is an enclosed porch. So what you've got going on here is you're officially outside the house. If you don't have a heating system and you're just trying to isolate the closed porch from the outside cold weather or the outside sun to minimize the effect so that you can enjoy it like a three season room. Let's say you're going to hang an electric heater like, like I did in my farmhouse. You don't have to be that concerned. What I would say is this. If you're going to insulate a space that has siding with no weatherproofing system, then you're going to have to use the rock wall insulation bats, okay? Because when, it, when it's windy, rain gets in behind the siding. Siding actually has a permeability rating because the wind can blow water in behind it, even though it's made of vinyl, all right? So consider that. If you use Rockwell as your insulation, then you don't have to worry about anything else because it does not get affected by rain and it'll dry out after the rain event, okay? So you kill all your birds with one stone with one product. Nice. You know what? It's 10-2. Let's do another hashtag DIY crew. If you're just joining us, we're giving away a $100 gift certificate to Amazon so that you can buy a tool without a battery of the same variety of tools that you have that have batteries. And why the heck not? And we're going to go hashtag DIY crew, and then we're going to get into rapid fire, answer some more questions. And because I'm chatty tonight, I might even go a few minutes longer. Um, we were going to do a one-hour show, but I'm feeling the need to squeeze an extra 10 minutes in because I've been a mouthpiece tonight. So everybody jump in, hashtag DIY crew. If you haven't joined us yet, that's the way you win. Okay, uh, we got Eric back in Ottawa. He's going to push a button. Bloop, bloop, bloop. It's going to populate an answer, and that person wins the prize. We'll contact you because we have that technology. It's scary what Big Brother knows, um, and this is how we get it done. Now, can we go right down to the very bottom? Well, maybe we should just stay here. You let me know. Right you let me know when we have a winner, and I'm just going to tell you a story about today because today I was pouring a concrete pad extending the landing area outside of my double wide trailer because it seemed awfully precarious to be able to bring groceries from a car, get past the railing and the screen door and not step in dirt. 
and I like to walk into a clean house. So I had to extend my landing area and pour a new pad. We have a winner. Well, the story's over. You'll have to watch the video. I'm sorry, what? Greg. Greg, right there. Greg at, yes. <laughs> Love to see you. From Topeka, Kansas, you won. Congratulations, Greg. <laughs> Loving it. This is fun. Can we do more of this? Woo! Next week, we'll do, we'll do some more. But you're going to have to watch the video and be part of the trivia question. All right. Here we go. I got Yunzer House here from Pittsburgh. Yeah, we know. 150-year-old Pittsburgh house. We've been there. I've answered so many questions about this house. I feel like I'm building it myself. It's <laughs> awesome. Any benefit to putting block in between the roof rafters, 16 on center, 2 by 6 unfinished attic, no rafter installation, putting in color ties first? Um, not on a 150-year-old house. I once had an engineer tell me, because it's been like this for 100 years. If you don't touch it, it'll be like this in 100 years from now. The best advice I ever got in my life. Saved me so much time and money. So, yeah, I understand. You, you look at it and you go, I feel like I need to fix that, but it's not broken. All right? The wood's dried out. It's already figured out its condition and its shape for the next 100 years. So it's not going to continue to maneuver, manipulate, and cause you problems. It is an established, what we would call, seasoned home. All right? So just enjoy it. And uh, stop parting around in your attic because it's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> Tim, you got an Ohio 68 split level Bathroom, shower, original tile. Do you have any idea how many houses in North America are still original tile from the 60s? I would hazard a guess, probably excess of 50 million houses. 60s and 70s, original tile. Can't even believe it. But every time I'm on Zillow looking at houses to buy, because I love to do that because it keeps my mind sharp, all I see is like original condition houses. You realize that there's nobody out there to do any work anymore? And if you want it done, you're going to have to do it yourself. Hence the need for the channel. Anyway, guys, share the channel with everybody you know. Share it. There's actually a share button, right? Open up your LinkedIn. Open up your email account. Pay for the plane to drive around your city. Whatever you got to do. People need to know about this stuff. Let's get into the next question. Harrison, it's 555. I'm going to go a little late. Uh, and you're in Kansas. Is that what KS? Doing a basement bath reno, removed drywall and found framing was done with sill plate flush to concrete wall and sideways studs. Okay, got it. Can I add a one inch rigid foam behind, remove framing and start over? Okay, can I, Okay, so Harrison, the answer to this question is this. Contact your local building authority, ask them what the R value in your exterior wall in a basement needs to be. Okay, and if they say 10, you go with the rigid insulation. If they say 13, you tear it out and you put in a two by four wall and you put in bad insulation or you put in an inch and a half rigid insulation. You can put in the, you can put in one inch inside your framing and you can put a half inch over top of everything. And you can actually use a, um, a PL 200 foam, ad, uh, foam board adhesive to attach drywall direct to rigid foam. <laughs> Think about that glue. Love that stuff. Uh, Romaldo, when framing for a concrete slab, do you measure inside to get the exact measurements or from the outside? Either way, just remember how thick your product is that you're using to frame. It doesn't make a difference. Whatever your brain is more comfortable with, I'll give you that. All right. Um, Corey Leach, by the way, says he lives in an area that does sell craft face, but our code doesn't allow it. See, that's amazing. But Corey, this is one of the reasons why you got to check your code compliant. Home Depot sells all kinds of stuff that isn't code compliant where I live. Like we have garbage disposals available in Canada, in Ottawa stores, but we're not allowed to have them installed in our houses. <laughs> it makes you wonder what the hell's going on, huh? I mean, but yeah, so always, 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 at the end of the day, the only authority that you have on anything is your local building office. All right. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Appreciate that because that makes some bloody sense, does it? The truth is, is if you have the paper face insulation and plastic, you're going to cause condensation there and you're going to have issues. It's not a good thing. Never want a double vapor barrier or contact with each other whenever it's available to avoid that. Okay, Northern Missouri double wide. Yes, bring on the double wide questions. I am ready to roll. You replace the bottom horizontal board around the outside of the house, sealed it up on the bottom to keep the bugs out. It's supposed to be open for airflow into attic. 
No, it's not open to airflow into the attic. Trailers do not have an airflow component in the outside walls at any point. So do not be concerned about that. All right. Cheers. Chris, member for three years, seven months, nine days. Wow, that's a lot of projects. Damn, Chris. Oh, we got to have a two-year and a three-year now. So we need a silver house and a gold house and a platinum house and a diamond house. I don't know what the hell we're going to do. You're just two months away from being a three-year member. Cheers, gentlemen. Appreciate all your help, and I appreciate your support. My goodness. What else are we going to say to that? All right. Wow. Let's get. Let's go right to the very – let's go right to the front. We are going to go – we only got a few more minutes here, guys. We're going overtime. If I haven't answered your question, you got it. You're going to have to type it in again because we're just going to stay current, and I'm going to do rapid fire. I'm going to try to stay up with the questions, and the minute that I'm caught up, we are stopping this broadcast. Okay, Mike, we'll answer yours. You're on the screen. You're in the market for a martyr, miter saw. Don't want to spend an arm and a leg. Harbor Freight carries Bauer products. Do you have any experience with those or other budget-friendly recommendations? Yes, I do. I actually am down here on the double wide. I didn't get a chance to bring all my tools. So I bought the tools for this job at Harbor Freight to save money too because I was experimenting for guys like you. And guess what I found out? Yeah, they're a little iffy, right? With some of the some of the some of the performance and some of the issues are like, man, yeah, they could make they could tweak this, they could make this better. There are better tools on the market. But you know what, dude? They bloody well work. And at the end of the day, anything that's available for sale at Harbor Freight is better than anything that was on the market in 1985. And I've been in construction a lot of years. And I tell you, if in 1985 someone came up and said, hey, would you like this Bauer table saw? I'd have been like, hell yeah. Because it's better than anything we had back then. So it's all about perspective. If you're on a budget and you want to save a few bucks, then that is a hell of a great way to go. Um, all right. We went backwards. Nobody questions? Okay. Mike, you're looking to dig post holes for footers for a deck in Massachusetts. Local code requires 48 inches. I've seen that you should lay gravel below the poured concrete. Do I need to go to 54? Oh. So the only reason that they want gravel below your concrete is what? Somebody recommends it because like, there's lots of great advice out there. But if you took all of my advice and never, all of that guy's advice and all of that guy's advice and all of that guy's advice, you'd never get anything done. You got you to pick your guru, my man. Mike, if your code says dig a 48-inch hole and put a stick in it and throw in concrete, then that's all you got to do. Don't give a damn about anybody else's special advice. Okay? You got to just move forward or you're never going to get anything built. All right. Cheers, my man. Yeah, that's frustrating, but that's the way it works. Uh, you're finishing the daylight basement robster with 10 and a half foot ceilings. Nice. For drywall on the walls, best to avoid butt joint and do seams either two and a half feet from ceiling or floor. Preference, pros, cons. Okay. If you're going to go horizontal drywall, do a full sheet in the top, full sheet on the bottom, and put the joint in the middle. And I'll tell you why. Because it's work to fix that joint no matter what you do. You might as well be standing upright like God intended you to instead of on a ladder trying to fix it or hunched over and sitting on a little stupid mechanic stool trying to fix it, okay? And besides, when you walk in a room, your eye light, your eyesight is going to be about the middle of the wall, and it's easier to bend the light over a long stretch in the middle with all both joints right there than it is at the bottom because the light is shining down at it, Okay. I'm just saying, my experience, anything in the middle is easier to finish, and you can see it, and you can be pickier, and the lighting is easier to make it pickier. As soon as you move it higher or lower, different times of the year, different lighting, you're going to have issues. All right. Hey, how's your day? Just winding down from work over here. Constructed house built in 1990 or 91. We're not exactly sure. And the joists look like they're just being held up by two-by-twos. Should I be worried? 40-plus and later. You know, if the joists look like they're being held up by two by twos, it's possible that they are. What you want to check is are your joists sitting on top of a steel beam or do they notch it? And two inches is sitting on top of the steel beam because I have seen that. I don't know why that got allowed, how that passed inspection. But uh, yeah, it's scary. I actually renovated a church. We had that same problem and they had the kids in this church downstairs and they had all the adults upstairs. and 
it was to the point where the, 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 the cracks in the floor joists were up six feet long from the steel to the point where if they hadn't had a fire in that church, maybe even just days or weeks later, the parents of that church would have had their Sunday school and they would have come crashing through the ceiling and they would have killed all their own children. So that was fire was actually a good thing because we, we solved that problem. Then we got a super chat. Celia, cheers. Um, oh, you think I'm the best. That's awesome. Question, your mom's basement is framed right up to the concrete. So just to confirm, we do Tipar, foam, bat, and then vapor barrier. It's okay. There's no space. It's an old wartime home. Hmm. Okay, so if you're going to go with your, your foam bat, Foam bat. I'm concerned. You're phrase, framed. Okay, so if you're framed right up to the to the concrete, here's what I'm going to suggest. Um, if it's an older house, you really, really, really want to have an airspace in behind your wall. Okay. Um, an old war home is like 40s, so you want an airspace. Here's what you can do. Most of these walls that are attached and framed right now, there's only a few locations along the ceiling where it's screwed to something or nailed to something and a few locations where it's nailed to the concrete. And if you got a hammer and a pry bar, you could remove all those nails, pull that wall off the concrete a little bit and create an airspace. That would be your best bet. Then you can put your tie par in behind to manage your insulation so it doesn't close the airspace off. All right. And that'll give your house the ability to dry and breathe a little better. Because remember permeability, things got to breathe when they're old because they get wet. So that's what I would suggest for you. You're going to have to adjust some of the framing a little bit. And if you can't do that, then go with rock wool insulation because it can get a little damp and it'll dry out. And so as you go through different seasons, okay, you'll find that it'll perform better for you long term without causing mold issues. All right. Cheers. But yeah, I mean, if you can avoid leaving the framing and fix it, that's your best bet. Wow, AJ. All right. I got a couple more minutes here, guys. Northern Missouri double wide. Cheers. Power to the double wide. Can I remove the red steel beams going down the middle? <laughs> sure. <laughs> if you don't want to have a house. Yeah, that's awesome. I appreciate that. That is some funny stuff. I do appreciate it. I appreciate all of you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Don't forget Saturday's video. The easiest fence ever built. You're going to love it privacy from your neighbors. It's very affordable. It's very easy, very quick, very sexy, very trendy. And then next Tuesday, we are going to be talking, oh my God, why the housing market is not like chicken little, the sky is falling. We're going to talk about all that. Okay. You can be, feel safe and comfortable doing renovations in your house, knowing you're going to get that return on investment, knowing that you're investing in yourself and in your future. Don't let fear ruin your life. Don't let it rule your life. We'll see you next week. Cheers. Love you. Talk to you later. Jeff said. Mm -hmm.